So I want to read to you a passage of scripture that we're going to look at for a few minutes this morning. And it's from Matthew chapter 2. And it's, it's the story of, uh, of the wise men. We're going to be talking about the wise men and how they followed this star and they come to a stable. Um, so not a literal stable because by the time that they really came to Christ, uh, he was, they were living in a house, but they were living in Bethlehem still. And uh, it probably wasn't the, the best of digs. Um, but, uh, you know, just when, when things aren't what you expected is really the theme of today's message. But here from Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 through 12, it says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who's been born King of the Jews? It's interesting that the, the Magi went to Jerusalem and they went to the king. Because they were looking for a king. But where do you go when you look for a king? You go and look for a king where kings <coughs> reside, palaces. And um, we saw his star in the east and had come to worship him. And when King Herod heard this, he, dis he was disturbed in all Jerusalem with him. And we, he called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law. And he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by, by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star, uh, they saw the star that appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child, and as soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. And on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. And they opened treasures, their treasures, and presented him with gifts of gold and incense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, because he didn't want to go and worship Jesus. But having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. So what do you do when you follow a star? <coughs> And you find a stable when things aren't what you expected. And um, in that little video that we just saw from the skit guys, uh, they referred, uh, he, re he referenced this scripture in, in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8 and 9. It says, my thoughts. This is what God says. My thoughts are your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways. As high as the, heaven, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And so what God is wanting us to know here is that he thinks differently. Obviously, because if any of us were going to set up a king and, and a, a kingdom, uh, being born impoverished, in slavery, um, homeless parents at that time, uh, in a stable, I don't know if any of us would have picked that. That wouldn't be how we would set things up. And uh, yet God, he thinks differently than we do. And so today, the star that we're talking about, that the Magi followed, the star represents all of our hopes and dreams. Because these Magi from the East, these wise men from the East, many of them believe were astronomers who were searching for God. Many of them believe that they came from present-day Iraq, or Iran, and that they were searching for the Messiah. Many of them believe, many theologians believe, that these wise men had roots and, and had come to know of God years earlier and had been passed down generationally all the way back to Daniel and Mordecai and Esther and men like Nehemiah and Ezra and, and Zechariah and Zerubbabel who had made an influence in Persia for God. And so that these men had come to know I'd come to know that there was this God whom Daniel served, and whom Mordecai served, and who Shadrach, and Meshach, and Abednego, and that they had heard the stories. And, and theologians believe that, that they had an inkling towards God going all the way back to the 600 B.C.s that had been passed down. And so when they saw this star as astronomers, they felt the need to go and, and, and seek it. And so what the star represents is what we hope and dream for. And these men were hoping and dreaming to find God, to find someone who they could give their life to and follow. But the stable, what the stable represents is all the mud and the muck of reality. Because when we read the Bible, it's, it, it kind of, you know, they went, 
They followed the star and came to the, to the Lord. But we don't read all about their journey and the difficulties of their journeys and how many times they were wondering as they were, as they were on their journey, is this a fool's errand? What are we doing? Are we being stupid and leaving our family and leaving our home and leaving our country to just follow this thing in the sky that we really don't know where it's leading us and we really don't know what we're going to find when we get there? And so, I mean, it's just easy for us to think, wow, they just followed this star. How cool. But there was a lot that went into it. And that's the mud and the muck of reality. We have this faith. We have this belief. We have these faiths. We have these dreams. And yet, then we're stuck within the day-to-day -day life of stuff, of, of, of just things not working out the way we thought. But once again, the way God thinks is different than the way we think. And if we follow Him, He may lead us even though we think we're following a star, we may find ourselves at a stable going, this is not what I expected. I thought once I made the decision to do this, it would be easy. No, there's mud and there's muck in anything that's worth following. And so these wise men, and here's the thing that I, that I take from this, is the first thing, and this is from Matthew chapter 2, verse 9 to 11, is that in the stables of life, when things don't work out the way you think they should, wise men find God always. No matter what the situation, no matter what the circumstances, no matter how much they were disappointed by the results or by what they found, they're still able to find God in it. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place the child was. And they, they get there, and here's the other thing. Now, it's not just, first of all, you have the circumstances of the place where Jesus is at, which is not the place that you, that you or I would have put a king. And then they find that he's a baby. He's just a kid. What does he know? Why, why would I follow this infant? It's just a kid. I mean, they're cute and all. We had a great time watching them this morning, but these are just kids. We wouldn't necessarily follow them. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed on coming to the house. They saw the child with his mother Mary, and here's what they did. The faith that this took, I mean, it's a beautiful Christmas story, and we love it, but the faith that this required for them to bow down and worship an infant who was not in the kind of place that they would have envisioned. It was by no means a star in front of them, though they followed a star. And I'm going to tell you, life can be like that. Where everything you expected, everything you hoped for, everything you dreamed about didn't come about the way you thought it should. But God had a plan. And you can find God in those plans. And here's the thing. It's, it's usually in the stables of life that God is found. It's in the hard places. It's in the difficult times that God is found. A prime example from the scriptures is a man named Job. Job was, according to God, according to the scriptures, the wealthiest man on the planet. I mean, this guy had it all. He was the Donald Trump or the, the, the uh, Buffett or the Gates or the whatever of the world at that time. This guy had it all and in one day lost it all. And that's not what Job expected. And it wasn't because he was a bad guy. It wasn't because he was a bad businessman. It wasn't because he was being judged. It wasn't that God condemned him. In fact, God was the one who said, Hey, have you noticed my servant Job? He's a righteous man, upright in all his dealings. He's a good man. And Satan says, Oh yeah, he's a good man because you give him everything. God says, You watch. You take whatever you want from him. And he'll still worship me. You see, wise men, no matter what happens in their life, are able to still find God and worship Him. And here's what Job said at the end of Job 1, after he lost everything one day. He says, hey, you know what? Naked I came into this world, and naked I'll depart. What I've received has been from the Lord, 
And when it's gone, it's from the Lord, but I'll still praise his name. Now, I'm paraphrasing there, but he says, I'll still praise his name. And then the narrator of Job says, in all this, Job did not sin. By breaking covenant with God through his mouth, he still found God. No matter how disappointed, no matter how much his world was shaken, he found God. Um, <clears throat> but immature Christians, here's the thing. When, when, when life doesn't turn out the way they want, oftentimes they turn their back. Oftentimes they abandon. Oftentimes they give up. Oftentimes they say, this doesn't work. But wise men find God always. And here's the other thing, is in Matthew 2.11, we see that the, that the wise men in the stables of life, they give their best to them. Well, nobody else is. Nobody else was coming to the stable and, and giving gifts to this infant. And they gave this infant some very powerful gifts. And these gifts had some, some not only some great value, but some real deep meanings. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, incense, and myrrh. The three things that those, that those gifts represented. And I, I'm not even sure if the wise men understood all this, but it doesn't matter whether they understood or not. In fact, it's kind of cool that if they didn't completely understand it, because they gave it anyway. They gave the best of what they had to this infant who there was nothing external that would tell them this is a king. They're in a stable. He's, he's poor. His parents were uneducated. And they're Jewish. They're not Romans. Romans were in charge of the world at that time. Who is this little baby? And yet they opened up their treasures and they gave their best anyway. But so often when you get in stables of life, when things aren't working out, we shrivel up. We clench our fists. We pull back. But these men pushed forward. They gave their best. The gold... It represented what you would give to a king. And so the gold represents the fact that Jesus, they were believing and they were saying, this infant is our king. They also gave him incense. The incense, also known as frankincense, was what priests would carry. It was a priest, it was, it was for the office of the priesthood. And they're saying, whether they know this or not, they're giving it anyway. Their actions are saying something. Whether they have full cognitive uh, understanding of what they were doing, their actions are saying, we're going to give this infant what you would give a priest, because he's our high priest. They're not only saying, he's our king, he's our high priest. Myrrh, myrrh was burial spice. And they're saying, I don't know how they knew this, the Spirit of God, of course, but whether they did or not, they gave, and they're saying, and they're giving, they're saying, we believe that you're our sacrifice. Wise men, even when life is hard, even when life doesn't turn out the way they expect, still give. And it's, uh, It's in the stable that can cause people to not give their best, to pull back, to close their fists. And say, well, I don't understand this, so I'm not going to give. There's no blessing there. None. What, what if the wise men, what if the story was different? What if the wise men came to the, to, to, to the stable... They follow this star faithfully and they're doing everything right. They get there and they see this infant with Joseph and Mary and there are these poor uneducated people, this blue collar guy and his wife, and they go, and she's probably a teenager, and they're going, yeah, I'm not giving this guy my gold. And the other says, you know, I, I, how is this infant a priest? And represent me before God. Because that's what the priest does. The priest would represent the people before God. 
What if they said no? What would the story have been like? There's times that I've said no because I didn't understand and I wouldn't give. Never let the unexpected in life dictate your giving. Because the, 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 the only person that will really, really hurt in the end is yourself. The wise men would have been, there, there would have been no mention of them had they not given. And then finally, wise men are open to new avenues. When, when life throws you a, a curveball, when, when life isn't working right, wise men see that and choose to change. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, because Herod said, hey, when you find him, come back and tell me. Then they had a dream, don't do it. And they went another route. Are we willing at Christmas to take another route? Are we willing to go another way? Are we willing to make changes in life? Sometimes it takes a stable to cause change. Sometimes you get to a place that was unexpected and you go... Okay, so something's off. So if something's off, here's the thing. If something is off, then we should change. Don't we want to be on? Yes? We want life to work. So if life isn't working, do we just keep doing that which is not working in hoping one day it will? We know what that's a definition of. Insanity, doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting a different result. No. At some point, we come to a place that's not working. We come to a following a star, following our hopes and dreams, and we come to the stable. It may be that God brought us to the stable to get us to change. You see, we rarely change when we see the light. Well, I said always. Maybe some people don't always change, but we can put usually. We usually change when we feel the heat. And it's in the, mud, in the mud of reality. It's in the stable. It's where life isn't working right that you're feeling the heat of unsuccess, of unfulfillment. And that can cause us to say, at least it causes wise men to go, I'm going to do things differently. I want to do things differently. It's in the stables of life that we need we see the need to reassess our direction. What's your direction for life? Where are you headed? Are things working in your marriage? Are things working as parents? Are things working in your business? Are things working in your finances? You have hopes. You have dreams. But are they working? Has God brought you to places to help you to find Him, to help you to continue to be a giver and reaching out to others, reaching out to Him, and then to even change your way of living, your way of thinking, your way of operating. Because if you do, then you've just given yourself a really great Christmas gift. Yourself. And that's a new direction. Finding God, following God. Be better, heads. There was a time my life wasn't working the way I wanted it to. I was young, but I was not fulfilled. I was not happy. I life wasn't. I wasn't doing what I knew was right. And I made a directional change. I decided to surrender my life to Jesus Christ. Some 34 years ago, 33 years ago. I asked Jesus to come into my heart. I asked Jesus to forgive me of my sins. And I asked Jesus to not only save me, but to be the Lord of my life. To become the Lord of my life. Where He could direct me. And he could move me. And he could change and mold me. I gave the Lord that permission. 
If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, if you're not sure that you know Him, you can ask Jesus to come into your life. And in doing so, what you're, what you're, what you're giving is your permission to God to begin to change you, to begin to mold you. And this Christmas, you can give yourself the best Christmas gift ever by asking Jesus Christ to come into your life, by asking Him to forgive your sins. Of all the decisions I've made in my life, that one decision was not only the best, but the decision that will last forever. And that was my decision to follow Jesus. He is the star. And even though you may find yourself in a stable, He's the star that makes everything in life right. Jesus, we give you thanks this morning that you make things new like myself, like many people. And I just encourage, if you've never given your life to Christ this morning, that you would do so. All you have to do is ask. In Jesus' name, amen.